And I see the president is here, I'm sure. He, he's, a, he's a timekeeper, so he makes sure that uh, when we have to start everything, he's on time. I know every time I've been a bit late, he's looked at me and said, you're late. So I made sure that I arrived here at five o'clock, so that I must be on time. So we're going to do this song. Um, as you can see, there's only two of us from the band. Uh, we couldn't bring the entire band because if we brought the whole band, it would have been logistically impossible. However, we decided Billy and I will render some of the songs that many of you might probably have uh, identified with. This is a song by Abdullah Ibrahim, who we love so much. And many of you will probably know the song that he plays at every wedding. And the song is called The Wedding. We should continue. We keep waiting for Vusi to point a finger. One more. <laughs> I 
Okay, we're gonna walk off. <laughs> now we'll 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 welcome you on stage because it's your turn now. I am an African. I owe my being to the hills and the valleys, the mountains and the glades, the rivers, the deserts, the trees, the flowers, the seas, and the ever-changing seasons that define the face of our native land. My body has frozen in our frosts and in our latter-day snows. It has thawed in the warmth of our sunshine and melted in the heat of the midday sun. The crack and the rumble of the summer thunders, lashed by startling lightning, have been a cause both of trembling and of hope. The fragrances of nature have been as pleasant to us as the sight of the wild blooms of the citizens of the felt. The dramatic shapes of the dragon's back, the soil-colored waters of the Likwa, Ikreli, Lotugat, and the sands of the Kharahad, have all been panels of the set on the natural stage on which we act out the foolish deeds of the theater of the day. At times, and in fear, I have wondered whether I should concede equal citizenship of our country to the leopard and the lion, the elephant and the springbok, the hyena, the black mamba, and the pestilential mosquito. A human presence among all of these a feature on the face of our native land just defined, I know that none dare challenge me when I say I am an African. I am the grandchild of the warrior men and women that incensed the Kukuni land. Patriots at Tetrai on Mpepu took to battle. The soldiers Mushwesh and Gungunyane taught never to dishonor the cause of freedom. I am the child of Nongaose. I am he who made it possible to trade in the world markets in diamonds and gold and the same food for which our stomachs yearn. Being part of all of these people and in the knowledge that none does contest that assertion, I shall claim that I'm an African. Today, it feels good to be an African. We are African, and we are proud as Africans and South Africans. And I think this speech talked to our very beings uh, and part of who we are and what we can be. This evening, I welcome you to the Tabu Mbeki Presidential Library Design. You'd see on the program before you, there's a quote, and I thought it apt to repeat this quote. It is not given to every generation that it should be present during and participate in the act of creation. I believe that ours is privileged to occupy such historic space, close quotes. And tonight, 
I do believe that everyone in this room and those who are on the live stream watching this event are indeed privileged to occupy a historic place to make a difference. Because, and I'd like to quote, the future cannot rob itself of key elements of history. It cannot deny itself the accumulated wisdom and knowledge of our ancestors. And we cannot construct progress without a clear vision of our past. Our biggest weapon is memory. Memory that begins to unearth, document, and systematically package our past experiences and contributions. So this evening, as we unveil the presidential library design, we will see that the Tabu Mbeki Presidential Library will reflect on the history of this country and continent. The library will become the receptacle for containing and sustaining documentation of ideas and solutions relating to the African past, present, and future to transform and achieve Africa's renaissance, close quotes. So this evening, we will have a program that goes through the rationale of the Tabu Mbeki Presidential Library. We will look at forging uh, strategic partnerships with the Presidential Library, and we have the Minister of Sports, Arts, and Culture, Honorable Nati Mtetwa, here with us. We will also have President Tabu Mbeki sharing the strategic vision of the Tabu Mbeki Presidential Library. And then we have Sir David Ajayi. Welcome, Sir David, who will give us an overview of the design scheme. And I will then, um, and I'm Geraldine Fraser Moliketti. I'm sorry, I made an assumption you know me. Um, I will be leading a discussion with President Mbeki and uh, Sir David Ajay. And our deliberations this evening will be concluded by uh, Dr. Brigalia Bum, the chair of the Tabu Mbeki Foundation. So before we proceed any further, I will call the CEO of the foundation, there's got to be a face to a foundation, and he will do a welcome at this point. So over to you, CEO. Thank you very much, Chancellor. Um, my name is Max, my surname is Borgwana. I'm the Chief Volunteer Officer of the Tabo Mbeki Foundation. Um, President Mbeki, Mrs. Mbeki, um, wherever you are, happy belated birthday, which was the birthday yesterday. Honorable Minister Natim Tetwa, Chair of the Tabo Mbeki Foundation, Dr. Brigalia Bam, and my other bosses that are here, the Vice Chancellor of UNISA, our partner in this project, your excellencies, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, each and every one of us in this room and those of you that are joining us virtually have been invited because of the special place that you occupy in our patrons' imagination and the important role that you are playing in the economic and social life of our country and our continent. We wish to apologize up front for imposing on you more obligations at a time when many in our country and our continent are despondent because of the failure of politics, the stubborn economy, and we're still the devastation caused by COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic. We, at this point, recall President Mbeki's counsel when a nation is faced by the things that this country is facing, when he says, Gloom and doom has never defeated adversity. Trying times need courage and resilience, as our strength is not tested during the best of times. We must continue to reimagine and putting together building blocks for a better Africa, if not for us, for posterity. The reason we are here today is that a few years ago, Mrs. Mbeki conceived an idea 
that the works, writings, artifacts, books that reflect the thinking, the practice, and the influence of President Mbeki, spanning over a period of more than six decades, which encompasses the period before presidency, which we all know that was the period of the struggle for all humanity. The presidential period, which is the period of building a country from the ashes of apartheid and colonialism to the one that was not only debt free, but an envy for the whole civilized world. And the post-apartheid, um, the post-presidential period of President Mbeki, which has been characterized by his practical attempts to bring peace in the whole of the continent and to focus this continent on its developmental challenges. More importantly, Mrs. Mbeki made it very clear that the center will feature a permanent exhibition of the role of women in the development of our continent. She therefore galvanized many of us to be part of this idea. That is the reason that the Tabo Mbeki Foundation and the University of South Africa took this challenge and say we will make this dream a reality. On the other side, President Mbeki's contribution to the idea, as you can imagine, his modesty, is that the library must not be something that is only pinned around his name, but it must be a container of knowledge drawing from his peers and the generations before him, whose commitment to a free and proper, prosperous Africa is beyond doubt. Collectively, therefore, that will be a gift to future generations. Already this idea has led to the return of the works of former president of Ghana, Kwame Nkrumah, to Africa, which has been held in the United Kingdom for more than five decades. So over the period of four years, we have sifted through President Mbeki's own works, digitizing it whilst we are receiving other works. Later on in the program, Geraldine will indicate the much ground that has been covered. But today we are reaching another milestone, which is the unveiling of the design by an outstanding and inspiring African whose work for us is not only about the design structure, but is an epitome of Africa's excellence, Sir David Ajay and his team. So as we do so, we wish to invite all of you to join us to making this idea whose time has come a reality. Geraldine was asked to let you know that we are required to raise at least 500 million rands for this project. As you can imagine, President Mbeki spent most of his life in service of humanity and never sought to use the office for personal accumulation. He's got no idea how to sign for shares. And I suggest that this should not be regarded as a cardinal sin. Those of us that are here tonight are not here out of boredom, nor invited by us to play the foolish games <clears throat> of vanity projects, but to declare that if there was time to lead an African renaissance, that time is now to, refer, to restore Africa's status and dignity, to reinstate our position as an academic, economic, and democratic powerhouse, to rejuvenate our beautiful but battered continent, from a long, harsh period of stagnation and strife, to go back to our history, invoking the heroes and the spirits of our past, using the power of memory to shape humanity, encouraging the spirit of reflection, of thinking, of learning, of curiosity, discourse, and debate, where we will be able to say enough of finger pointing, enough of anger, enough of shouting, we can't hear each other, but we must hear, we must listen, we must create the space in our hearts, in our mind, and in our soil. The space to reflect on the Africa that is, the Africa that was, the Africa that could be, the Africa that passionately pursues the ideals of its renaissance. A space that nurtures culture of reading, of scholarship, and participation that embraces the, wi the wisdom of elders, of our poets, our free thinkers, our provocative thinkers, our radical thinkers, a liberating space, a healing space, a living space that is mindful of the sacrifices borne by our ancestors, 
because history forgotten is future lost. Let us build our battered, beloved continent, understanding our differences and our diversity, our vision for unity. Let us move from state of dis-ease to discourse, from selfishness to solidarity, from fragmentation to freedom, by bringing everything you are, everything you want to be, everything you want us to be, to this space that can hold us all. We hope to engage with each and every one of you that are here tonight um, in the coming weeks and coming years to discuss how can, we, how can we, together with you, play our part as share owners in this development of the container of knowledge. At this point, I would then want to call on stage the Honorable Minister of Arts and Culture, who needed not to be convinced about supporting this project to address you and, and later on invite President Mbeki. You are all welcome and have a great evening. Asante sana. Program Director, Ms. Geraldine Fraser Mlekiti. Uh, His Excellency, the former President of the Republic, President Tabumbeki, uh, the Chairperson of the uh, Tabumbeki Foundation, uh, Chairperson uh, Dr. Prikalia Bam, and the entire Foundation uh, Board members, the MEC for Sport, Arts and Culture in Gauteng, uh, Ms. Mbali Lope, uh, here with us, uh, members of the Diplomatic Corps, distinguished guests, Members of the media, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Dumela. It's a great pleasure and honor to be with you on this auspicious day to be amongst the guests invited during the unveiling of the architectural plans for the Tabumbeki Presidential Library. We meet under these uh, strict conditions imposed on, on humanity by the global outbreak of coronavirus pandemic, this outbreak is a constant reminder of the relationship between humankind and nature that it is not always harmonious. At West, it uh, releases disasters such as earthquakes, uh, diseases, and so on. So ours is to ensure that we continue the national effort uh, to save lives, protect ourselves, and protect those who are uh, amongst us. Let us turn back to the issue of the design of the launch of Tabumbegi Presidential Library and our support to this groundbreaking initiative. We support it because we believe that uh, it is a strategic partnership. Uh, and when we're approached by uh, the CEO, uh, we always talk like this when he talk about support, uh, especially financially. Um, so when he raised it with us and uh, the, the foundation itself, uh, it was very natural for us because um, at two levels which are interwoven. One, the cultivation of the culture of critical thinking, reading and writing, of which uh, we are investing a lot, whether through libraries, through bursaries uh, to students and so on. And at the second uh, level is uh, the level of uh, what we call resistance and, and, and liberation heritage route. Uh, just a few months ago, uh, the government has decided uh, that uh, we should actually build uh, the resistance and liberation heritage movement museum and for us that connects us with uh, the continent uh, and, and the diaspora. Uh, we, 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 we will continue to ensure that uh, we support this initi initiative because supporting it means that we are in a better position uh, to ensure that uh, our people in the country understand clearly the saying, the African saying, that until historians, uh, until lions have their own historians, the history about the hand will always glorify the hunter. But today, with this process of launching this library, we are saying the lions 
are introducing their own historians so that they are able uh, to undo that which was done by our, our SOL colonizers. So we are happy and uh, we, we want to say that uh, this library, uh, let it illuminate our path and house treasures that will influence generations to come. President Mbegi, I've spoken a lot. I, I think you can come closer to where I am, because if you don't, I'll continue. Uh, but welcome, President. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Minister. Let, let me join our program director in saying welcome to everybody who's come here tonight, as well as, as she said, as well as others who are around the world, and both at home and across the world, who, are, who have joined us uh, via these modern communication systems. Uh, but thanks a lot indeed for, for coming. Uh, but also, I must say welcome to uh, Sir David Ajay, uh, our architect for the Presidential Library. Uh, you'd be very surprised if I told you the story about where we met him. Uh, maybe, maybe David, I can say it. Maybe it was a godsend. Um, that we could link up with this outstanding African architect uh, well known globally, has handled lots of architectural work across the globe. Uh, just, uh, was it last month or so, something like that, uh, got the Golden Award in England for the best architect. That we, we got him. Yeah, I think we're very, very lucky. But thanks, uh, thanks, Sir David, for coming and for working with us. <clears throat> He's actually more than an architect. He has joined us as, a, as an architect, surely. But also the way the matter has, uh, he's taken it up with his heart and therefore it's part of a process of let's work together to make sure that this dream comes true. Thanks, thanks a lot, Sir David. I'm, I'm also very glad that uh, the Vice Chancellor uh, of the University of South Africa is here. And the reason for that is again has been mentioned, we are, <clears throat> this presidential library is part of the University of South Africa Library. There's a very, very good reason for that. That library, UNISA Library, is the biggest library on the continent. Uh, there's no university library anywhere on the continent that comes anywhere near the UNISA Library. A lot of experience in terms of library work. So the CEO of uh, the foundation was just saying now that uh, for some time now, people have been digitizing this material which has accumulated over the years and is being digitized by people from the UNISA library. I'm giving an indication of the capacities that are in that library. I must also say thanks a lot to Minister Natim Teto for coming the involvement of the government of South Africa in this is very, very important. Uh, a few days ago, the President of the Republic, President Ramaphosa, talked to me about this. And indeed, he told me that uh, Minister Mtetwa would be coming today and gave me an indication of what the government of South Africa thinks about projects of this kind. And hence, it's this determination to get involved in ensuring that this succeeds. Uh, I shouldn't be too long. 
Uh, I think the point has been made. We are trying to make sure that uh, all this huge store of knowledge that many, many of us in this country have comes together in this library. That matter which uh, our program director so that we don't lose our memory, because that memory is very, very important in terms of helping us to define better what our future should be. Uh, I'm very, very glad indeed that, uh, again, as Max said, we've had responses once the project got known, responses which have gone beyond our borders to say that uh, other Africans also want to belong to this project. That's why, as Max was saying, we already have Kwame Nkrumah's archive here. It was about to be given to the British Library in London uh, when uh, a fellow African, a Ghanaian, heard about that and intervened and said, no, this uh, Kwame Nkrumah's archive cannot be, doesn't belong to the UK. And that's how it came here. In the next few weeks, uh, the CEO of the foundation will go to Dar es Salaam because the Julius Nyerere Foundation wants to link up with us because they are saying also that huge volume of knowledge and experience represented by what Mwalimu Julius Nyerere had must also become accessible in terms of our knowledge of our past, in order, as I was saying, in order to define our future better. You're having the same response, fortunately, within the country. Uh, we have among us here uh, a, a famous poet. Uh, in fact, he is the, the current poet laureate, uh, Mungane Wallis Rute, uh, who's been a uh, a prominent poet in this country for many, many decades. And I think indeed they're beyond, beyond our borders. I'm mentioning him, among others, because he said, but with a, a library of this kind, it answers a question for him as to what does he do with all of these scripts these unfinished poems which never got published, what does it do with them? They belong to this library. So there are many, many people in the country who are coming to say, look, I've got, this is part of my own contribution to the making of what became the current South Africa. This material belongs here. And there is a A picture that uh, comes on the one who one sees it now and again uh, on the internet. It's a picture of uh, the old late Oliver Tambo and Mikhail Gorbachev uh, and two other people. There are four people in that picture. That picture was taken when. Uh, Oliver Tambo led an ANC delegation to the then Soviet Union um, to meet the government of the Soviet Union. And that was the very, very first time that the General Secretary of the Soviet Communist Party uh, and therefore occupied the position he did in government met with the leadership of the ANC. So Gorbachev said to, to OR, look, I'd like us to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting uh, so that we can talk very frankly to each other. Um, I will bring an interpreter. That interpreter will also be my 
record keeper, my note taker. Now, so you can bring one of your people to be your note taker. Now, I happen to be the youngest person in that delegation, so they said I must go as a note taker. <clears throat> so I'm one of the four people in that picture. Now, there are only two records of that meeting. One of it is in Moscow, the other one is in the library. You remember that uh, <clears throat> In the lead up to the negotiations in 1990, the South African government said uh, part of what enabled those negotiations with the, AN with the ANC to take place was because the Soviet Union had walked away. Uh, so that whole threat of uh, domination by communist Soviet Union and all that with the ANC as its instrument that, that threat was gone. And therefore we, FWT Clerk and company, that's what made it possible for us to talk to the ANC. I see that story told in many books when people are discussing what is it that facilitated the possibility of the negotiations. It's part of the story that's told. And the story is entirely false, not true. Now the library, this library will be able to show people to say, okay, read these minutes. Uh, because in that meeting, Gorbachev said, you know, we are uh, talking, we're talking to the Americans, as you know. And one of the things that we have agreed is that in terms of the regional conflicts, Let's, rather than compete with regard to those conflicts, USSR versus the USA, why don't we sit down and see what contribution we can make to resolve those regional conflicts, except for liberation movements. Yeah. In terms of liberation movements, our policy cannot change. Yeah. We have to support liberation movements. So he said, uh, even the Americans have said, okay, okay, we can't contest you as far as that is concerned. You'd remember that uh, this was uh, long after Vietnam and the Americans had learned a lesson uh, from that. But I'm saying the story that is told here about what happened is, is quite false with regard to that. As a result of which you then have a particular construct that is made about South Africa today and tomorrow because based on a falsehood. Now we want to make sure that all of this knowledge that's accumulated among many of our people becomes available in this library. Because I'm saying, it's not merely a matter of knowing what happened yesterday. It's particularly a matter of saying, what is it that we do about today and tomorrow? But yesterday is very, very important in our view in terms of answering the question about today and tomorrow. And so, uh, in a sense, it's a library of a particular kind. The South Africans like this thing about, about special types. Maybe it's a library of a special type. Because we intended that it must be a center of conversation of engagement among ourselves uh, about, I'm saying the past, but today and tomorrow, not only about South Africa, but our continent. And I'm very, very, very pleased, pleased indeed that uh, a place like that, which we think will be important, will be designed, constructed, made up in a this extraordinarily imaginative way, this extraordinarily attractive way, such that indeed, even to look at it is to say, as they were saying now, I'm proud to be an African. David, come. Thanks. <clears throat> Very
Excellency, Minister, um, ladies and gentlemen, all protocols observed. Um, one of the great joys of um, having the honor of being in the presence of such a great man of the continent is always hearing these incredible tales and stories that always, I don't think I've ever had one meeting with you where I've not learned something new, so I just wanted to say that. Um, it's an incredible honor and privilege to be working on this project because for me, it's, it goes to the heart of the Renaissance that I believe that the continent must start to look at in the 21st century. I've just left my pointer on the table just as I was being very serious, so forgive me. <laughs> um, the opportunity for me when I was asked to, to look at this project was more than just to make a container, a building, but it seemed that the very brief that the president and his team were asking was to imagine a way of using architecture which has always been the device that's been used to define, to define epochs, ages, times, to see if architecture could be marshaled to also make a form that could create a new image of what this particular library um, seeks to be about. Um, the site is in the beautiful um, neighborhood of Riviera, um, in Houting, in this beautiful city. And it's striking because, can I move the next one? Thank you. It's striking because it's a neighborhood with incredible mature trees and landscapes, a history of architecture that moves from its origins as, you know, in the 15th century farms. It was really a place of settlement, um, becoming much more organized as farms before becoming um, a, a suburb and a neighborhood of the city. So when I am looking at this site, I'm also looking at the extraordinary um, geological time um, that exists here and the way in which people live on land. The site is in an urban condition, but is on Main Avenue and North Avenue. It's lucky, blessed to have a frontage onto Main Avenue. So we're able to make a civic front to the building to welcome everybody. But the building is conceived not just as a front and back, but a form that is to be engaged with in the round. The site is where the current foundation is. and will really make use of this extraordinary urban block with its extraordinary foliage and gardens and create the center within a landscape that will allow for scholarly study, debate, not just in the building, but also to use the landscape and the space as a teaching tool, as a space of debate and discussion. When I started to look at this with all my work, I really um, am, a, am obsessed with the artifacts and the research of the continent, as most of you might know. And I seek not to, in my work, sort of go into just my imagination and draw, but to see if there are lessons from the past that can guide the way we look into the future. When I was asked to do this, this work, the idea of looking back at the architecture of our of the civilizations and the gatherings and the communities of the continent, of course, came to mind. I looked at tombs and palaces. I looked at farmhouses. I looked everywhere and realized that I needed, that these were specific forms and this type of building was something new that required its own articulation. In the end, what struck me when looking between the images of the vernacular architecture was to notice that in all the communities of our continent, our, the science of the habitation of those communities was the ability to cultivate the land and to live with the land. And the secrets of those was the technology, 
that had, as it were, sustained those communities, the migrations that came down from the north to the south. That technology is what was brought with those communities and also subsequent generations, the migrations that have made this great country. So in a way, for me, it seemed like that the answer was staring right in front of me, but it was not what I thought it was. The answer seemed to be that we were talking about creating another store, another space of, of knowledge. But the knowledge, this time, is not a granary store where one keeps the seed for the future generation which sustains them and nourishes them and allows them to continue, but a different seed, a seed of the knowledge of the works of the great liberations and movements on the great work of His Excellency. Once that idea became clear, it felt like the building unfolded itself. The beautiful program of the building encompasses, as the president said, the ability to gather, to debate, to have libraries, to have in-depth research, to have exhibition spaces, to have a place just of conviviality, to eat and rest and to reflect, to have a space that has uh, the ability to have performance, but also a serious place where the study, archiving, and the uh, maintenance of these documents is also kept. The proposal is to make um, eight, what I call, knowledge stores that sit on a plinth in this neighborhood. These eight new chambers become the rooms of the program that I've just outlined, the auditorium, the great library hall, the women's center, um, the exhibition space, etc. Each one is articulated with a zenithal light that will give it a unique atmosphere. So though there are eight arranged as a pair, almost as if they're male and female, four and four, they are each articulated with a particular atmosphere and create an ensemble that makes an axis with um, North Street but face Main, but also create a stage and a, a grounds to the, um, the in, inner part, the inner part of the, 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 the composition. So this is an overview, looking down on it. And the thinking is to really make something that really understands the genesis of that form, but also creates an architecture that is radically sustainable, reinvigorates the technology of understanding the use of our earth as the primary resource, the ability to make spaces that allow inside and outside engagement, but to make a dignity also in those spaces that creates a new engagement. This is just a slice to show you the program. It's not to go into any detail, but you can see how what I'm calling the history of these one-room forms of our, of our heritage can make these incredible chambers which interlock and create interlocking spaces but also create um, their own distinct rooms for reflection or for debate or for exhibition or for um, arrival. The plinth contains the hard work of the storage, the exhibition spaces, the presidential uh, library, as it were, this sort of display of the president's um, uh, history pre uh, um, uh, present and, and post uh, presidential uh, life and connects with the network that is being discussed, outlined, the library in, in the, the university library, etc. This is the kind of engine that is the base that makes the, the upper buildings work. This is a sort of slice through that. You can start to see what we're trying to do. This will be probably in the country the first net zero building so it will be carbon neutral, and it will really show a new, we believe, a sort of renewed, not new, a renewed attitude to an architecture that was always here, all over the continent, but also specifically here. View, I'll quickly go through a series of views. From the street, these stores of knowledge, chambers of knowledge, are bisected with these lenses of light. 
they become these incredible rooms where one is at once looking at a future, but also seeing a past, able to articulate each of the spaces differently to allow for gatherings, for, to allow for events, but each with the sort of zenithal light that I spoke about, the specific light. We want an atmosphere that wants, that encourages excellence, that encourages excellence in those who are engaged with the work. And we hope that the project becomes a very important seed in the renaissance of architecture and the work that is being discussed in this library that needs to be catalyzed all over the continent. Can we um, show it? I have a little animation which will just sum it up and then we can go into the questions. I think another round of applause for that. I think that's absolutely <laughs> magnificent. This is the point at which I invite uh, both the president and Sir David Ajay to come to take the seats at the front. Um, I'm going to stand. What's very clear listening to this presentation is that uh, extensive work has been done. I think there's no question about that. The Taubombeki Foundation has completed a comprehensive feasibility study and members of the Taubombeki Presidential Library Professionals Team have been identified and are currently being appointed. There's a clear project plan with a finalized budget. And as you've seen, um, la the land required for phase one has been acquired and that's been uh, pointed, us, uh, pointed out to us. In terms of work in progress, construction is scheduled to, commen uh, to commence in the fourth quarter of 2021. And there's currently a town planning process, traffic study, and environmental compliance component that's still outstanding. So this is where everyone else comes into play. And at this particular point, I'm going to uh, start a discussion. And I hope there's mics that are available. I'll take one from here. And 
we need a, you're going to share the mic. Um, there's no spray around, but I'm sure you've... Uh, um, so we'll, uh, we'll sort that out. So I think let me uh, start at uh, this particular point. And I'd like to direct the first question to you, Mr. President. And uh, you've spoken about the vision and we've heard you both on this. <coughs> and we know that a presidential library, that cough was because I didn't have water, no other reason. <laughs> We know that the presidential library is about memory, about preservation, about education, liberation of the mind, experiential learning, and anticipating the future. It's all embracing of nation formation, and you've spoken about that and continental development. I'd like you to reflect on this and educate us about the use of memory in a presidential library with a goal to, as you and uh, Sir David said, to educate, prepare young thinkers, not only to be effective political leaders, but to be leaders in all spheres. Your thoughts, Mr. President? Well, Geraldine, the, uh, I, I think perhaps as one, as one gets older, I think one gets to understand even oneself better. Um, and in that context, I'm trying to say, I would say that, uh, you know, I think what one discovers uh, a lot of the time is that uh, many things which you think are your own personal discoveries are not in fact discoveries of something new it's an expansion of your frontiers of knowledge. It's something which you didn't know, which you think you, you created. You didn't. Uh, it's important, I think, to understand that, to understand the importance of memory, therefore memory, to, 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 to understand the past. Because it really does empower you to create the new. Instead of trying to create the old, believing that it is new, when it isn't. I'm saying the knowledge of that past enables you to create the new. You should ask Sir David this question, as to why these buildings are red. Yeah. Because when we talked about it before, I thought we think we normally think red brick. And he, he said, he mentioned this thing in passing, that historically when he looks at the tradition of African architecture, with all of these buildings he was showing, they are mud brick. Mm -hmm. yeah. So he said these buildings are going to be mud brick. So uh-uh, said so David. You can't. <laughs> and he explained it. Explained it technologically that you see you've got this extraordinary knowledge, indigenous African knowledge. You can't throw it away. Let's mm -hmm. base ourselves on this indigenous knowledge in order to create something new. This mud brick that turns out those buildings red is a new kind of mud brick but it's based on this historical knowledge among Africans. And I think that's a good example of the importance of the knowledge of the past in terms of helping you to create what is new. And I think that's what this library must do in terms of training new generations to, to be builders of a really new reality. They need, they need that memory. So on that note, Sir David, uh, you're going to tell us about these red bricks, and Maybe. we're going to hear that. But as you do that, you've also built a practice rooted on the appreciation of African design, and it's come through through the presentation. 
um, and its African design heritage. Talk to us about the journey to uh, discovering and understanding this as a possibility, and especially for a professional of African descent who was educated in Europe. I mean, there must have been some tensions there. No, um, firstly, maybe I should answer the red brick and then I'll come to this. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that, because the answer is in that. Yeah. Um, that I think that ultimately, um, for architects of color, searching for the identity and the way in which they must understand or try to use um, their histories or other histories, the diaspora of histories, um, that they feel compelled to, to find, to use, to express their humanity in this. Um, it became clear that we clearly have had not that industrialization that created, has created the modern world that we see. Um, but, you know, a story that I always love when I was reading from a, a dear friend, um, Oquin Weza, who's passed recently, who's a dear friend, who was a dear friend, who is a dear friend. <laughs> he talks about how, you know, the Renaissance in Europe happened from the fragments of the destruction of Rome. Mm -hmm. The architects and the artists searched for fragments. They didn't have Rome, it was gone. Mm -hmm. And they looked at fragments and reconstructed the body which, become, which became the Renaissance we know now and think of as though that is the classical world that existed. It is not. It is a reconstruction. And I think that that is a clue to a generation of architects searching for knowledge that we have the fragments and we have to now let the fragments teach us how to make that world again and not to see the fragments as ruins or not part of the world that you know is modern or you know can't be relevant and also at the same time we can't just mimic the fragments because the fragments are from a different time we have to learn from the fragments and see how they can allow us to boldly go into a future. So for me, that was the same. I was, you know, I'm, I was born on the continent. I was born in East Africa. My parents are West African. I traveled all over the continent, um, a blessing that I now see um, because my father was a diplomat. Mm. I was educated in Europe in my teens and um, sort of early 20s and then I moved, I, my thirst for knowledge took me all over the world. But in the end, I always kept coming back to the continent. Um, and it's the meditation of the continent, and at the beginning, through the tragedy of making uh, projects that were about trying to honor black lives, um, either in the UK or mm -hmm. in the US, that compelled me to really be steadfast in meditating on what these fragments could teach and to use the, the critical thinking of you know, what one has learned to reflect on that and to imagine possibilities. Wow, Mr. President, this fragment. And if I think of your work on this continent and I think of Mali and Sudan, South Sudan, and all over. What message before I open up to the audience for further questions? Yes, I think what, what, what Sir David has just said, uh, the, the relating to the question that you've, you've just raised is, is really critically important. Um, I, I think everywhere you go, on our continent, you can see this maybe this fragments of the past from which we got to construct what is what is new. There's a wealth, a wealth of history. Um, you know the, uh, you know that uh, we spent quite a bit of time in in Sudan and asked by the African Union to do some things there in Sudan. And one of the things I regret about that is that we never had time to visit the north, uh, Nubia in the north. Yeah. 
because that's where you find the first pyramids before the Egyptian pyramids. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an extraordinary story uh, of that African civilization. In the end, at some point, they produced the pharaohs of Egypt. Yes. They came from Sudan. And when we look at, uh, they have looked at the museum in, in Khartoum uh, of that civilization, it tells you something, it gives you inspiration to do something that is new. Uh, you know, here at home, they let me just tell you a story. Maybe it's not for this audience. Uh, and the audience at large. And the audience at large. You know, there was some scholar in Europe some years back who wrote uh, an academic piece about... Uh, the psychology of liberation in South Africa, and put out a thesis that really that kind of arrival at psychological emancipation came to us rather late, in the 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm. So I read this Leonard thesis and I was saying, but uh, um, what she doesn't know is like, uh, I don't know what you call those things, Geraldine, necessary rhymes of children in the townships. <laughs> uh, you know, if you take a, a necessary rhyme like, I don't know if it's called a necessary rhyme. Cheese, cop, tamat, makunda, kunda, and log, the rahula, missus, wasali, nyama, yot. Now, what does that tell you? You find half a dozen or eight South African languages in there, and some rude comments. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't say those children have a sense of psychological oppression. Mm -hmm. That very thing that they do in the streets like tells you something. So I'm saying that there are many, many lessons of this kind of various kind as you go around the continent, whether it's language and literature, architecture, so on, which if we grasped it better, we would be able to better to utilize the indigenous knowledge to do all sorts of things, mm -hmm. including in medicine and, and so on. It's a particular challenge, but uh, we, we need to respond to it. So before I come back to you, I actually wanted to open to the audience. And uh, I shouldn't call you audience, the participants here tonight. You're part of us, you're with us in this. Can I get one or two questions before we go on to the last part of this and before I come back to the two? And please introduce yourself as you... Uh, Stand up. Uh, just hold on for the mic because people out there won't be able to hear you. President Becky, uh, uh, Sir David, uh, just to be in your presence is unbelievable. Um, I, it's un it is unbelievable. I, I think I, I'm living in between generations. I'm 48, so I also never go to the president and not learn something. But my children are 15 and 17. And while I'm battling is how do we get the next generation interested in the presidential library? I mean, it's absolutely magnificent. Is there something I find often today minds are shaped by 18, 19 years old, and it's almost too late for them to intellectually realize what they've missed out because they've been either iPads, iPhones. How do we, just a suggestion and a concern I'm living with in between, seeing the brilliance of our forefathers and hoping our children will be as brilliant, but already making their minds up by um, Twitter, Instagram, social media. And how do we get that depth for them to truly see the importance of what came before them? So as I come to you to answer that question, there's also someone here who's involved in the youth program on Buy a Brick who will talk to that afterwards. But let me come up and maybe you start. Sir David, and yep. you may want to respond to 
the earlier comment by the president as well. I'll, let me respond to that one yes. <laughs> first. <laughs> um, you know, it's 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 a constant it's a constant issue that is you know there is no magic bullet. But what I definitely can say to you is that the citizens, children or adults, perform on a stage called the city, and indirectly it fundamentally affects how they perform. And if the performance stage is a certain way, the performer, <laughs> so architecture and the symbolism of architecture is so profoundly important. And we found that out just doing the National Museum of African American History on the Mall, we thought that there would be no engagement. People said kids would not be interested. Mm -hmm. The, fear, the, the mere fact that this form exists on this site has caused a whole inquiry. So we underestimate. Sometimes we think it's just about, oh, can we just engage on Twitter and stuff? That's all going to happen. There's an incredible outreach program. But also the form, which is the stage of their life, also has to change. Because if it doesn't, it feels like it's not real. That's why architecture matters and why the renewal of architecture matters. But I think the, the uh, uh, what would I think what is inspiring uh, in terms of just what was Zev Krangel uh, did introduce himself. Um, the the young people, my experience, young people here in this country and indeed in other African countries, have got very inquiring minds. They are always asking questions from the simplest question. Uh, did you enjoy it when you were president? <laughs> Why do you ask? Not because I want to be president. So I'm saying that if we start from that position that you have these young children, young, older children, they, they've got very inquiring minds and they, they always are asking questions, they want to know. I think the challenge becomes, however old you are, <coughs> is how, how, do you, how do you satisfy that hunger for knowledge? Mm -hmm. Because it may, it, may, it may be wasting your time if uh, you then give them uh, the memoirs of uh, churches for a 10-year-old to say you are asking this question, read these memoirs. That doesn't make sense. <coughs> But the way you respond to them, the, I suppose this is a matter of teachers. How do you teach this art of reaching the mind of the young, who I'm saying are very, very thirsty. That's my experience for knowledge. And I think that will be part of the challenges of the library to, to have that knack, that ability to reach out to these young people, and this is a very important observation to make, and that we need to do it, but I think it is possible. I saw Saki Matozoma indicating that he wanted to speak, and I hope that's also indication of a pledge, Saki. <laughs> You're spoiling my appetite. <laughs> um, so David, I'm very captured to use colloquial language here, by the concept of fragments. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm careful in articulating that in the sense that sometimes the, the, the history that has uh, created fragments in us as a people, we tend to dwell on that and that we forget as Hansi, in the, the Chinese writer says, we forget the waiting grain and we watch the, the chaff that rises. Mm. Because I am of the view that the gathering of the fragments of our history over time is probably the only way forward for us without us um, tearing in the gutter and worrying about what everybody else thinks about our heritage. So that concept has captured me and I'm grateful for that. 
Um, the present will remember and Zev will remember something we failed in. When uh, we were offered a technology to record, not only to record, but to be able to retrieve from a, a storage perspective, to retrieve a knowledge about what life under apartheid meant. Whether you were a boy from Kwazakele like me, whether you were a farmer from Zepetiel, so that we can have this kind of storage of history accessible to people with the technology that enables people to access it. And so I, I, I must say that just looking at uh, Sir David, your representation of what I believe is the ideal of what is being created evokes uh, in me and I hope in many other people the entire experience of, uh, of this kind of, for instance, I don't believe you would be familiar with a lady called Noni Jabav who wrote a book called The Oka People. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the red brick, okay. it invokes in me uh, Noni Jabavu's book called The Oka People, which, which she wrote in the 30s. And um, all I want to rise in to say is to say thank you, and I hope we build on this. So, yes, I think uh, clearly the library is a much-needed intervention in the memory deficit we tend to suffer about the story of our journey and our journey to liberation in South Africa, the story of the African continent, and so on. So why does it seem as though, Mr. President, that we haven't really taken this chapter of the process of liberation so seriously? And I want to build, I mean, that builds on the comment by Saki as well. Well, I don't know, I'm not sure if I'll be answering your question, but uh, I, I think all of us are familiar with, uh, I hope anyway, uh, we're familiar with uh, a book series, uh, The Road to South African Democracy, mm -hmm. uh, which is currently in its volume eight. That does not necessarily mean eight books, because some of the books are volume eight, part one, part two, part three, which is about this question, about the history of South Africa's road to democracy. Therefore, a record about that liberation struggle over a certain period. Uh, it's, a very, it's a very important initiative and it contains, those books contain a huge volume of knowledge about that liberation struggle that you're talking about. Part of the challenge uh, has been, has been uh, I'm, I'm that, that SADET, South African Democratic Education Trust, is part of the Tabumbegi Foundation and that was also part, uh, affiliated also to UNISA. Uh, part of what is being considered is how do we take those books and uh, write them in a way such that they become accessible to the young people that Zev Krangel is talking about. Mm -hmm. So it's a very big project about that. Part of what happened in the preparation of those books relates maybe to what Saike has just been saying. Because it included, it involved a lot of interviews uh, of people who were involved in the struggle, which were recorded. Uh, not in the sophisticated manner that I think Saki is talking about, because the technology that was offered to us, and indeed he knows, Zev knows, and he knows, I know, uh, which we was offered, and we didn't, we did, I'm not quite sure why we didn't get it, but indeed, but this is maybe lower level technology, but they were recorded. These are records that again will be available in the library. So you'd have a record, you'd have, for instance, uh, just I mentioned one of them, uh, the, the chairperson of the Bruder Bond, uh, 
in the two years, three years leading up to liberation and after 94 was uh, Professor Pete DeLange. Mm -hmm. uh, played a very important role as, as, as a chairperson of the Bruder Bond in helping to facilitate the transition. Now, this, this project, the South African Democratic Education Trust interviewed him, recorded him. So the library would have a record of this. Now, listening to this prominent Africana leader, in his own words, what happened, what were the circumstances, and all of that. So I'm, I'm answering this question, uh, the program mm -hmm. director of yours to say, there has been a very serious attempt, in fact, to attend to this matter of recording that history of liberation in these two forms, both in the book form and in this recorded voice thing. Um, so not all is lost, therefore. And that all that material and material will be available in the library. Mm -hmm. Do you want to add to that? And uh, then there are two questions at the back. There's three questions. I'll take all three and we'll respond to it and then go to the last part. So let me go right to the back and I'll come to you, Minister. My name is Sophie Mkwene from the South African Broadcasting Corporation, the foreign editor. Mr. President, I just want to find out what is the most treasured material that you have that you haven't perhaps shared with anybody or a story you haven't <laughs> shared with anyone. <laughs> that will perhaps when we visit the library as ordinary people will really tell a story of Thabo Mvuyalambik. I'll tell you why, Mr. President. Some of us were very privileged to work with you in terms of us being journalists and covering stories. And at times, we were privileged to hear stories and, you know, get some sort of knowledge that propelled us at times to be who we are today. But many people are saying, who is Tabumbegi Handling? Because you don't like to talk about the real Tabumbegi. When are you going to write a book and tell us who is Tabumbegi? <laughs> and why Tabumbegi left Eastern Cape? Why Tabumbegi went to Russia? I don't know whether it's true or false. Uh, and uh, got Sophie, a military are you, training. Are you starting to tell the story yourself <laughs> at this stage? Maybe I should, <laughs> I should allow you to come before I come to the minister and the one other. Um, do you want to tell the Eden story? No, no, let me ask the other question. <laughs> Minister Mtetwa, and then I'll go to the back of the room. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. And um, I think you asked a very uh, pertinent question about our own liberation. And... Uh, the value we attach to that. The president spoke about the, the SADET uh, process. Coincidentally, uh, many a scholar who are part of that process were part of an earlier process uh, by SADC, uh, which uh, uh, it assigned to General, the late General Hashim Bita uh, of Tanzania uh, to compile in fact, it's a nine-volume uh, work of General Hashimbita about the liberation struggle in the frontline state, or SADC, uh, as you put it. This is one of the key reasons we thought it's natural that we get into partnership with the, with the library, the presidential li library, because uh, it is about to complete the whole picture of what UNESCO um, charged the leadership of the continent mm -hmm. to come up with what is called uh, the roads to independence. Now, you have this sudden uh, project of South Africa 
you have this Southern Africa project of the resistance and liberation heritage route. And then you have to complete what uh, the entire continent and the diaspora, we are expected. It, it doesn't happen, um, you know, every day in the life of a nation and a generation that uh, Africans are asked to write about their own story. As we speak now, the AU and everybody else is expected to write about that story. So it, it, it is going to ensure that as we move forward, we understand who we are. That is why I said earlier on that government decided a few months ago that uh, we, we should create a resistance and liberation movement museum. You have apartheid museum, you have Fort Trekker, and so on. But the movement, the liberation movement museum, coupled with the Koi and San heritage route, that is what um, the, the government is seized with now, so that we respond to this question and uh, also respond to the hunger on the thirst the president spoke about uh, of our people generally about ourselves. Thank you very much. You can see, Sir David, the virtual, you had indicated in the library there'll be spaces for discussions and all, and clearly the discussions have started. I think already there's uh, indication of what the success will be, yeah? Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much, uh, Mr. President, uh, for this great um, initiative. My name is Billy Monama. I'm a composer, a guitarist, and a researcher. And um, I, I really, you know, believe that uh, this initiative, it has the same objectives with what I'm doing. I'm really moved by uh, this initiative and I've been following it for the past you know, couple of years. So my question is that, um, will this initiative um, uh, be incorporated with the curriculum uh, you know, of, you know, in, the, in the education? The reason I'm asking is because um, I was, I mean, I'm a scholar, I went to school to study music. And, you know, from the young, from, from, from the young age, you know, I, I've been playing guitar. And in schools, there is no curriculum that speaks much in depth about uh, South African heritage. And when we speak about decolonization, I think that is where we should start, uh, you know, decolonization. De 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 you know, moving, moving, moving the, 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 the Europeans from there. And by, by saying this, I, I'm, I'm not only saying is, uh, this because I'm, I'm moved by, um, you know, uh, being here only. Already I've started with my initiative. Um, I'm writing a book about South African uh, guitar evolution where it started from as far as 1930s, you know, and... Um, I, I, I can say that, um, you know, nationally that when, when the book is, is, is published next year, I will bring uh, the book thank to them. Thank you. Thank you very much for yes. that. Thank you. Thanks very much. I, I, was, think, I was not done, but it's okay. <laughs> we, yeah. we will invite you into the space. Thank uh, you so much. To take thank the you. discussion forward. But thanks very much for that. Um, I, I believe that there are artifacts in the room. So please uh, have a look around. And I'm told, uh, Sir David and Mr. President, that amongst it, we have the original transcript of Kwame Nkrumah's book, I Speak of Freedom. So Sophie, you were asking what uh, is there. I think this is amongst it. But I'd want to come back to you for just a, a last uh, comment. Um, so David, how would you measure success of the existence of this library and this important architectural work? I mean, for me, no less than sparking a new imagination about the Renaissance of Africa. 
I think that it's not about the size of the building, it's about the, the idea of the building that can really create change. Mm -hmm. So I hope that we are all co-joined in sparking this renaissance. Mr. President? Well, there may be to answer that question by answering the other questions that were posed. <laughs> um, with regard to the last one that was posed, uh, part of the thinking with regard to the library is that we must use this modern technological communication means to ensure that the library is accessible to many schools so that children don't have to travel to here in order to access the library, they can do it wherever they are. So the plan is there was something like we're talking, for instance, about a thousand schools on the continent mm -hmm. and schools within the country. So that young people at school have got that kind of access immediately. So that is a question that was posed, whether there would be that. That's part of the thinking with regard to the, the access of young people to what would be in the library. We come back to the question that Zev Krangel was raising. Therefore, you need make to make sure that, therefore, you also design what becomes accessible in a way that helps the young people to be able to access this, this, this knowledge. Uh, with regard to the matter that Sophie were asking, no, Sophie, there's nothing about Tabon Peggy in, the, uh, in this thing. <laughs> I don't know when uh, he will write this thing that you are asking for. <laughs> But I mean, there are many things. You remember, uh, um, all of us would remember that Maggie Thatcher, the former prime minister, the late former prime minister of the UK, it was very stubborn against supporting the liberation struggle. And so Nelson Mandela and others were, terrori were terrorists, uh, all of that. Um, it took a lot of persuading to get her to agree to all sorts of things. But she was, uh, she was that kind of person. And then uh, uh, Mandela and the others get released from jail. And an invitation came from her that she wanted to, uh, to meet this Nelson Mandela, whom she had called a terrorist. So I was very fortunate I was in his delegation that met Maggie Thatcher at 10 Downing Street in London, uh, just before lunch. So there was a discussion just before lunch, and then we went and had lunch, and then we left. Uh, so as we were sitting there having this discussion, uh, one of the staff at 10 Downing Street walks in. Uh, and the one day he whispers to all of us mm -hmm. whether we wanted to have anything to drink before going to the lunch table. So when he came to me, he said, uh, what do you want? So I said, what will the prime minister have? Mm. She say, he said, uh, whiskey with a dash of water. I said, <laughs> I'll have the same. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <clears throat> Now, I didn't, I was taking notes at the meeting. So, Sophie, you'll find the notes about that meeting with Maggie Thatcher, <laughs> but none of this, what I've just told you, I didn't write that down. <laughs> so, there are lots of things like that that you will find, but not, not about me. But I think the point that Minister Mtedra was making is important. Mm -hmm. Because, in, uh, relating uh, uh, to the question we're raising about why are we not paying enough attention to the matter of the liberation struggle? And it's correct. We've done this work at home. There's a work he referred to quite correctly, which is about the liberation struggles in this region of Southern Africa. That's the thing that was uh, done by Hashim Bita, of the struggles in Zimbabwe, here, and uh, mm. Angola, Mozambique, da, da, da. And then he says there's this other thing that UNESCO wants to cover the whole of the continent. So it is, it is in the right thing. They are all of them connected together. And I'm, I'm coming back just finally at Geraldine to this matter. You see, we, um, we were very fortunate to have access to Kwame Nkrumah's archive. Mm -hmm. And that would have included material about Sekuture in Guinea. Mm -hmm. 
because uh, as we remember, Kuma Nkrumah, after he was caught, he went off and stayed in, in Guinea. So there would be material from there. Now I'm saying that uh, the Max is going to be attending to this connection, connection of ours to the Julius Nyerere, and that will give us access to that material for the library so that it becomes more universally accessible. And so uh, that's, that's going to happen, uh, I'm quite certain, not just with regard to South Africa, but many other people on the continent, to use this as a location of this kind of store of knowledge that, that, that we need. And so this thing that the minister is talking about becomes part of that. So indeed, uh, the one of the things that must happen is that even this series of nine books, which are about the liberation struggle in Southern Africa, also need to be available through this library. So it, it, it will happen uh, so that indeed it becomes, it's, more, it's, not, it's, not, it's not just South African. That's why you have an outstanding African like mm -hmm. this one. Uh, I should say something about it before I finish about him. Uh, a bit of a mixed up kid. <laughs> uh, born in Tanzania, Tanganyika, because his father was a Ghanaian diplomat. So he's a diplomat in Tanzania, then he gets born there. And then there's a coup in Ghana, so he ends up in England. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they call him a Tanzanian, but in fact he's a Ghanaian. <laughs> So, but now he's become a South African in addition. <laughs> so, <coughs> so we, uh, <coughs> yeah. but I think that is uh, indeed what the library needs to be, a home for all of these African connections. We help also to do what Saiki was saying, uh, to put together these fragments of, 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 of our own histories. Mm -hmm. To write our own history, not as we are saying, as minister is saying. I think, uh, finally, thanks a lot to everybody for coming and bon appetit. We're not done yet, sir. <laughs> We're not done yet. <laughs> but uh, yes, indeed. I, I just quickly want uh, Professor Vincent Mapai to say a word. Um, we can excuse you to your seats and we can get you to hold the mics there and use it from there if so required, but if you're patient for a few more minutes, yeah. I think you need a microphone, yeah? Um, this, this one there. Thanks very much, Program Director. Uh, I got worried when you said you'll ask me to say a word. You see, never ask a pensioner to say a word. It's, <laughs> it's high risk. When Max told me that uh, I'll be saying something, I said, Max, never give a platform to a pensioner. Right, but but I'll pension. cut you short <laughs> if there's a need. <laughs> But uh, he was relieved when I said I'll keep my comments to under two hours, so. <laughs> but uh, on a serious note, I just thought the irony about the Tabumbeki library is that it's actually not about Tabumbeki, it's about South Africa and Africa. Mm -hmm. That's what it is all about. And I thought to reverse this, uh, natural injustice, I should say something about Tabumbeki because uh, this occasion puts him as a footnote, so I try to say a few words to get him into the main text. And two things that struck me about his presidency, both as a deputy president and a president, is that he had a clear plan and a focus on what matters. The first thing he was prepared to get right was to repair the economy of the country. And believe you, 
believe me, if your economy is in disarray, everything else will be a bigger mess. It is as simple as that. And a serious leader, that's the first thing you want to get right. The second thing he got right as a priority was to remind us that as South Africans, we are not an appendage to the continent. We, part of it. we are Africans, we are in the continent. And most importantly, he knew that as a country, we will not survive unless the rest of the continent was, always, was also taken on board. The third thing I want to mention, it struck me, and he may have forgotten it himself, was that when we went to the national election after the first term, he was going into the second term, he did something extraordinary, and he may have forgotten about it, but as a political observer, it struck me as extremely counterintuitive. He reduced company taxes. <laughs> Go back and check. He may have forgotten himself. Why do I say it's counterintuitive? A typical politician would have raised those taxes and increased social grants. He did the opposite. And this shows that he understood that the first thing to get right is the economy. And that no economy has ever succeeded unless there was a very, very clear and serious partnership between government and the private sector. He mentioned SADET, the democracy project, that one of the successes of that project was that a number of private sector companies came on board as partners in that project. Why is it related to what I wanted to say? One, first of all, is to say to you, Minister Mteto, we are very grateful to you representing government to come in as a partner. It is very, very crucial. Without you, this project would wobble. The second point I want to make was I've always wondered what the trajectory of this country would have been if the private sector then had followed President Mbeki's example in his concerted and relentless effort to rebuild the economy. Whether the private sector came on board then, it's not a subject tonight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm saying tonight, I want to go back to the remarks I made earlier, that this project is not about President Mbeki. It is about South Africa. It is about the continent. And through President Mbeki's effort, South African business was welcome on the continent. And I do say we have the resources, both human and material in this country, to make the process work. And I'm appealing to my colleagues in the private sector that like government, like Minister Mteto, it's not late for us to come on board and make this project a success. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I may want to make three comments on that one. I think uh, Johan Rupert in the not too distant past actually confessed to the fact that the private sector were reticent and did not respond as they should have at the time. So you spot on, uh, Professor Mapai. I will differ on you with you marginally. Yes, cut back taxes for business, but did increase social grants as well. You know, so just want to say that. Last thing is, 
also understood and pushed the, uh, for the importance of a strong public service and public sector. Uh, strong institutions are important as well. I want to check if there are any other comments from the floor. Um, uh, and I know we're running out of time and the dinner is getting cold, yeah? So a quick one. Uh, can you wave your hand so that they can get a mic to you? Otherwise, you'll have to come up front, yeah? So, Kamre Chunara Mohamed, um, mailing guardian 200 inductee in civil society in the 2020 uh, cohort. As a leader of the youth, I would like to pledge my first brick, um, and I would pledge, and I would also encourage every single one in this room today to do the same, so that that will bolster, you know, the invigoration to what our country needs and the future that our country needs. Thank you very much. Thanks for pledging a brick. Yeah, thank you. Um, are there any other hands as we draw this part to a close? Oh. Yeah. Uh, good evening, Mr. President. Thank you, uh, Sir David. Uh, indeed, uh, it's a privilege and an honor for us to be part of uh, the unveiling of this uh, carbon neutral, first carbon neutral building in, in the continent, and indeed a uh, a repository of uh, and center of memory of the African Renaissance. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, for planting the seed in many of us to become protagonists of the African Renaissance, as you have taught us. We look forward to journey with you in realizing this life-held long dream of uh, building a center of memory for African Renaissance, as well as regional integration. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a last hand at this point? Yes, it's Ambassador Barbara Masakela at the back. Uh, I just want to say that uh, I'm, I would like to congratulate the Tabum Mbeki Foundation for having decided to have the library in a living community. Yeah. That it's not somewhere on the hill, you know, or where people have to travel and make extraordinary arrangements, but that it's actually in a living neighborhood where people live and there's lots of traffic. And um, I'm also very happy that thought has been given to uh, the participation of the youth uh, in the pro program and that there, there seems to be some plans for some interactive activities with the library. Uh, otherwise, I'm afraid, you know, uh, one thinks of libraries as those places where old people go. Um, I just, my last comment is, is that um, I, I think that um, the whole idea of the African Renaissance had at its center the creativity of the people on the African continent and the diaspora, and that I'm disappointed that there is no um, special place in the library for the creative arts. Thank you. But I guess there's, we need so many things that in the end, the library cannot do everything for everybody. But somehow, it is such a beautiful uh, you know, design. Uh, and I just cannot imagine all those dull scholars going in there and not having artists who are alive. And I, I've heard a murmur and in the background. <laughs> Ambassador Barbara, I must interject <laughs> because it, we'd have an exhibition space and a space for the creative arts to be there. 
You're absolutely Thank you. right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. And there are young artists that are actually involved in it right now, you know, in the overall process. I'm happy yeah. about that then. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And I also wanted to say on, on a personal level that, uh, you know, um, David is very modest because he actually has other buildings here in, in Johannesburg. And um, I, I think that, um, you know, they should be made known as well by, by his association so we're going with to get you um, to unveil the Tabombegi Presidential Library and among other things that he did design the pavilion for my late brother Hugh Masekela, mm -hmm. and it is a beautiful, beautiful work of art that we will always appreciate. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, I'm going to come to the front, but I had a sense there was one more hand at the back somewhere, no? Uh, oh, art sticks. Um, and, and let me just say that there are pledge envelopes, envelopes on the table. You've had the young man challenge us all to buy a brick. And, and I have two grandchildren, so I'm going to sort out something on that. Uh, and Floti, you've got to uh, follow up with me uh, on that. So, hot sticks? Uh, I, good evening. My name is Sipo Mabuse. I'm a musician like Billy, and probably some colleagues are in the house. Uh, I live in Soweto, and one of the things I'd like to say, thank you very much, Mr. President, for raising our consciousness about the, the, the library. Soweto is ready to contribute. People in Soweto have asked whether is it possible for us to invite you at some stage so that we can begin raising funds and contributing to the project. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I'm taking a law stand at the back. Yeah. This. Uh, Good evening, Mr. President and Sir David. My name is Tandy Coleman. I'm from Polyfloor, South Africa. Um, we are specialists in vinyl flooring. And um, the foundation of our company is based in um, heritage. And as the third generation, it is our legacy to, to continue this and to inspire and to um, motivate and guide the next generation and it is this passion in us to to guide that that fits so beautifully and and is so in line with the um Tabo and becky library and the builder brick campaign which personally just warmed my heart when i heard about it so we we believe deeply in um, education and knowledge and in in history and in, in listening to learn and listening to understand and, and listening to those stories that are told so that we can find the lessons and the nuggets and the wisdom that lies in, in history. And I think that it is that when we take that, that we can truly start to redefine who we are and reshape the future and craft our new destiny. Um, and so we have pledged to be part of this um, program and to contribute both financially and in terms of services. And I, um, we've joined along with Pindi and her gang in the, in the Build a Brick or Buy a Brick Foundation um, incentive. And it's, it's just so special to me and I think that that is a way we capture the youth and we, we create interest. And I was very privileged this week to have tea with Mam Mbeki and, 
and a couple of other people, and I was told some stories there that just absolutely redefined the way I thought about things in just a two-hour session, and I can only imagine what we can do if we can tell these stories to the next generation. So I challenge you all to get on board with, with this, too. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm going to hand over to the two of you for some last words. Uh, there's some buildings you haven't unveiled to us. <laughs> no, I, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm completely humbled by the, the, the reaction um, to this, this project, which I think is so fundamentally important. And it's, as been, has been said, I, I re truly believe it's not just fundamental for South Africa, but it's also a model for the continent. And I think the continent is watching. And I think South Africa has an opportunity to be a beacon to the continent about the importance of our history and how we move into the future. So I couldn't be more humbled to be part of this. Thank you. Mr. President. Uh, before we came here to into the room, we were sitting there with Sir David and uh, Minister Mtertwa and uh, <coughs> we were crying among ourselves about the state of the continent. Mm -hmm. That everywhere you look, starting from this country, uh, is a very gloomy picture. Uh, all, many, many things going wrong. Um, it's very difficult when you look around to see anywhere uh, where you draw hope and inspiration for a better future. <clears throat> but it's a challenge. I, I think that uh, this is part of the importance of this project about what we're about here. That perhaps we can use this as an instrument, a tool, a place uh, to convey this message of hope. So we can, we can as these Africans do something that communicates a better future. And I think the library properly handled can do that so that we, it acts as a bit of yeast, a yeah, bit of leavening um, to help the continent to move in the right direction. And as I was saying earlier, I'm really very, very pleased and very inspired that in, in, even in terms of what would be visible to the eye, the thing that Sir David has done, that that just the image will say to us as Africans, we can do better. So I hope, I hope that's what the library will do. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks, Sir David. As a continent, we can indeed do better. So we no longer live in an era where the person who holds the documents is the only one with the power. That the beauty of such spaces as the Tabumbeki Presidential, that is the beauty of such spaces such as the Tabumbeki Presidential Library. One can hold the documents and share them with other people all over the world. All of us are, en are enriched and no one loses. So the Tabumbeki Presidential Library is here for the long haul. We are building for the next generation. And for that, we will need, as was indicated earlier this evening, both financial and non-financial support. And we look to everyone who will and can assist by buying a brick and your name goes on that brick or the name 
of the one who you've uh, dedicated that brick to will be in the wall of the library. But let me at this point call on our chairperson, chairman, Sis Lope Brigalia Bam, to come and close this for us. We would not have an event without you saying a word. And then we will uh, continue with discussions for the rest of the ev evening. So over to you. <laughs> yes, I am. Can you come and push your seat for me? taking us through this evening. Uh, we were told, uh, you know, about the diplomats and all this, what you do, is that when the president had spoken, other people don't speak. You know, Miss President, you know, ancestors and living ancestors speak all the time, even if the president had spoken, so you don't mind. Thank you for taking us through in this exciting evening and exciting time. Um, I will not follow my script because uh, it's too difficult to do that at this time of the night. Uh, this has been a beautiful moment, absolutely a beautiful moment. And uh, I, I think that there is hope for this continent. I think this kind of vision and this kind of uh, a dream of the fragments, I found that this is a very interesting concept. And I'd like to ask that uh, we thank a number of people. Some of them have been thanked already. And so I will be doing the repetition. I do want to recognize you, but Professor Makanya, I have to, before I speak, because you are our very special partner. Stand so they can see you. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I would like also the members of our board to stand so people can see you. Uh, we have a lot of wise men and wise women. Stand members of the board so they can see you. Uh, uh, some of them will stand, they can see you over there. Uh, it, uh, the, 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 I think the library launch has, been, has given us so much hope on a number of things. Uh, your prophecy, uh, Mr. President, and your love and passion for this amazes me. Um, it's not in my notes, but I can't help but share it for those who would like to, to write a book. I was in church in this country assigned by him to manage elections, and in the later years, he proposed my name that I should belong to a very prestigious a committee we were called the Panel of the Wise for the Continent of Africa. Now, really, that's wisdom. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, for putting me into this committee. I'm not sure that the heads of states really believe that we were that clever. And we were supposed to go around the country to look at the elections. In the years of 14 years, and I'm not exaggerating, Mr. President, that's why a book must be written about you. He never asked me about South Africa. I had so many problems here, but I had money, so that helped. Thank you, Mr. President. I would go to him when the money, and I pretend to be crying, then I got the money for technology. Whenever he phoned me and the message comes and he says to me, either Sislope or he says mama, mm, mm, mama, dangerous, and he calls himself, then you must know that he is asking you to go to another country in Africa. Oh my goodness. Uh, and he did this for 14 years. I am not exaggerating. And I would want him to say sometimes, how are things going at home? Are you all right? Are the parties giving you a lot of problems? And I want to say to you, your dream and your passion for this continent, uh, it's amazing. I don't know where it came from because we all come from the Eastern Cape. Uh, 
we went to the same school, except that I was there 10 years ahead of him. And I stayed in the school until I completed. He didn't. Thank you very much, because... <laughs> So we will have many stories to tell about him and uh, to say your prophecy and your vision and your love for the continent. I hope the generations to come, and as we see, will also benefit that love, that we are part of a larger continent with all the challenges that we have. Uh, the establishment of library is something very special, and I think we've all spoken about it, and we see this library as something that is you know, the center of knowledge, of information, of really where the people of the continent and the generations to come will also be able to learn something about it. I am surprised to say, David, I didn't know somebody of your age could be say. And I've been thinking, <laughs> the first time I used the term uh, for a Sir to an African was somebody much older. He was called Sir Francis Ibiam. He was uh, coming at that, I met him at the time, there were conflicts in Nigeria, and it was a very, and I was very ignorant about the Sirs and other people and so on. And Sir uh, Ibiam was handing over, I don't know what you call it, Sir Hood, if you get cross with the British. I don't know whether you take it back, but it was a process where he thought he's too angry over the war with the position. And so he was taking back his say something. So it's wonderful to have you. You are our pride. You are probably the greatest pride. And my uh, grandchild who is doing architecture, he says, he is the best, I quote him, the best architecture in the world of the 21st century. That's what my great child said. And he went on to say that uh, because of that, they do not only look up to you, it has made them proud as Africans, and that they will not feel they are part of the deficit in the world, and they will go with their heads up, and I think it's important for you to hear what you've done to the young people of this country and to many, and not only this country, but to the continent of Africa. Do forgive me, uh, uh, people from Ghana always do the things that we like first. And I'm sure there are others who have done, and I can't resist to tell you the story because they can't stop me for telling my stories now. Uh, flown for the first time, I've told him the story, it's an embarrassing story. I was flown the first time by a Ghanaian black pilot in 1968. Uh, I'm sorry, I said the story, Sack. Uh, I was coming from a craft flying at this time, the big planes were DC 9, and I thought, oh Lord, will I make it? Because, you know, I had been so brainwashed in my country that the people who fly planes and are pilots and are captains are white. So forgive me for that. Please forgive me if there are anyone here who you understand that I was born many years ago and I'd never been flown. And then in the process, I said, oh, isn't it wonderful, I was pretending, isn't it wonderful to be flown by a black pilot? And I'm going to Ghana for the first time. Oh, isn't it wonderful? Because I am hoping to meet Nkrumah. And Nkrumah had established a huge building that you might not know called Job 600, uh, which was a big, big center of the African leaders to meet. It was, they'd already done it by 1968. And then while I was sitting there, a hostess comes and says, the captain would like to meet you. Oh my God, so it means I have to go to the captain. And not knowing anything about the culture of flying, I'm sure you are ashamed of me, forgive me. He puts on his cap, and I didn't know that when they do that, you are a real VIP. And so he made me a VIP. So when I read my book, I thought, and then we have also the thing when you, they write the history of our country, that the leading woman for the program to combat the racism, which were the staffs that in the World Council of Churches in 1969, this program was chaired by a Ghanaian judge. It was the first time a woman, I want you to know, who was a judge of the appeals court. 
And so these wonderful stories about the Ghanaians showing at the right time, we are proud of you. We love you. We can give you South African citizenship. <laughs> but I would like to, to thank the people who are here this evening. Thank you for being here this evening. And I want to thank those who participated this evening through the technology that we have. Uh, we have to observe all these things, so not everybody could come. And thank you for participation and for setting through. I also particularly want to thank those people who are already committed to join us in this journey. There are a number of people who are already working with the CO and the team, doing all kinds of things, and they are in the background, and I want to thank them for that. I want to thank people who have not actually made the donations, uh, but I'm sure they will make them. But I thank you before you do, so that you know that it is something that we will appreciate when you do, and, uh, and that we will be able to carry this journey. I think that this experience will help us not only to talk just about the library, but to begin as South Africans also on occasions of reflecting and talking about that those things that are important in our history and that we feel that the young people have to know. I spoke to a woman this morning, a young woman who was very impressed by what we are doing and said uh, she thinks that this library will do amazing things. I did tell her that. Uh, there will be a section in the library for women. That's all I knew. I, was, I didn't know. And so this recognition in that structure of the place of women is very important as it affirms women, as it also strengthens the identity of the women, and it also helps uh, to know that the women in this continent and in the world will always play an important part. And so as people in this library come and talk about the knowledge that will be there for the library and all the important things that will be taking place, we have not be forgotten uh, as women that they've been part of the history and will continue to be part of that history. Um, I would like to ask all of you to stand and we just uh, clap and thank everybody. And finally to say CEO to you, your team, done an amazing job of planning this uh, occasion, uh, hustles and hustles uh, of planning, especially this time when everybody cannot be here and we appreciate your team and the work that it has done. And uh, there are also a number of people here and I would like to mention those who are already donors and contributors. And my last word is join us on this journey, join us on this wonderful journey uh, that we are doing in the library and also on many, many other things. Uh, thanks to the technicians uh, that are sitting somewhere there that were able to communicate with one another. I'm sure those of you who are sitting there wearing your mask, you are so envious of me <laughs> because I'm not. <laughs> and this is the only time that we can have a little peace of mind and not wear our mask. Thank you for being here. And uh, uh, bon appetit, as the president had already said, enjoy your dinner. Thank you and thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, dinner will be served, so please do relax. Um, they will be handing that over. Thanks.